from Romans 11, 11 through 16. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life for, from the dead? In the part of the dough, if it's offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Good morning, everybody. Give me just a minute. I have something very important that I need to take care of. There we go. Hang on. All right. Beautiful. Oh, wait a minute. I moved. There. That's my good side. Like that. That's good. There we go. We, uh, I gotta make sure I upload this. I need to make sure everybody knows exactly what I'm doing on a Sunday morning. Because sometimes there are questions. Where's the pastor at? We live in a selfie society. Don't we? Uh, we live in a world where we want everybody to know what we're doing. Uh, we, we live in a world where it's incredibly important that everybody sees all of the wonderful things in our lives and none of the nasty things, none of the ugly things. I mean, if you think about it, uh, think about how pictures have changed over the last 50 years, okay? If you look back at a picture of uh, you, you might look at a black and white picture. You guys remember just looking at black and white photos? Okay. You might look at a black and white picture and you might be talking about, yeah, that's, that's great great grandma Edna and great great grandpa Bill, Edna and Bill. They just bought the new house for $1,400. They are really, really excited about purchasing their first home. Here's the picture. <laughs> They're thrilled, can't you tell? Nowadays, uh, there are more pictures available, more pictures created and available for viewing in the last 10 years than in the past forever. Combined. I meant to say again, in the last 10 years, there have been more photos taken and made available, made available for viewing than in the previous history of humanity. It's crazy. And nowadays, the pictures are a little different, right? The pictures are like, I got my coffee culotte at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Love and life, right? Things are different. We want everybody to see what's going on. And we want that feedback, right? You don't want to show somebody a picture and there will be no likes, there will be no comments, there will be no nothing. You, you want people to give you feedback. So you, you go on a trip or you get a house or a car or a new pair of clothes or whatever. You take a picture, you put it online, you want feedback. You want, oh, dang, girl, you looking good. Right? Now, I know Lou has gotten a lot of comments about like that from her pictures. Uh, <laughs> But you, you want some feedback. You want people to put things like, man, I'm jealous of that vacation photo with your feet sticking out of, of a beach somewhere. You want people to say that. I, I want to I wanna just kind of focus on this idea. And, and not that I'm against selfies, because obviously I'm online because 
it's the 21st century and to, to be a public figure, you pretty much have to. Uh, but I think there's something interesting in all of that. And, and I want to just put it right here. Does what happens here make people envious? So a lot of times we post our pictures, we want people to be kind of jealous. We want them to feel or want what we have or think that we have something that's really nice. And, and that's all well and good. My question, though, for today, and our focus for today is this. Does what happens here make people envious? I don't know if you caught it, but we're going to go to Romans chapter 11 because we've been in Romans, we're plowing through Romans, love Romans. Everybody say amen. Amen. I thought so. And uh, we're going to go starting verse 11. Now, last week, uh, we, we talked about and, and rehearsed some of what Paul wrote in early chapter 11, where he says, look, guys, the gospel went out to the Israelites, and they didn't want it. And so now it's been passed on to the rest of the world, even though the Israelites have kind of dropped the ball. They've rejected God, so to speak. And so he's going to continue that conversation in verse 11 of chapter 11. Where he says, again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Speaking of Israel. Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. That's interesting. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. It, it, it's as though... The roles have been reversed. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that the, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, were meant to kind of be a light. They were meant to point to God, to be radically different than everything else in their world. To make people go, huh, I wonder why they're like that. And it was supposed to, in effect, make people jealous so that they would ask questions and draw closer. And now Paul says, because of the Israelites' transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, everybody else, the rest of the world, to make Israel envious. So now it's Israel kind of on the outside looking in, going, why are they like that? Let's continue on. But if their transgression, Israel's transgression, means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? He's essentially saying, look, even though they're gone, uh, even though they're on the outside looking in, so to speak, even though they've been excluded and that has allowed, uh, has created a void that the Gentiles can now fill, even though they're walking away from God has actually allowed opportunity for others to come to God. That's all been well and good, but think of what would happen if everybody were on the same page together. Imagine such a thing. He says in verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles. That's you guys. In case you didn't know. I'm talking to you Gentiles. And as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I made much of my ministry, we'll talk about that, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my people to envy and save some of them. <coughs> For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Paul says, look, I am a, a pastor to the Gentiles, pastor to the people, traveling around Southern Europe, Western Asia, uh, the Middle East, planting little churches, telling people about Jesus and how he, changed, how, how he changed Paul's life. He says, as much as I am the pastor to the Gentiles, I'm going to make much of my ministry to make my own people, remember Paul's an Israelite, to make my own people envious and so save some of them. He says, I, I make much of my ministry. And the word there, make much of, uh, is actually the word doxazo. Everybody say doxazo. 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 And, and I don't know if, you're, if your ears can hear it, but 
Uh, you might recognize the word doxology in there. This kind of singing of praise, this making much of, taking pride in, lifting and elevating. I doxazo my ministry, he says. I doxazo the, the, the mission work that is happening. I doxazo the way that all these different people groups are coming together as one. I, I doxazo the compassion that is happening in all of these places. The Gentile church is on the move, and I want to make much of it so that the Israelites will go, I wonder what's, what's going on there. He says, I do that. Not just to make them envious, but I do it so that they might be saved. Because if they never ask the question, then they'll have no interest in coming to know the one true God. That's all of Romans that we're going to cover today. I hope that's okay. Five verses. Not much. But I want to hang with that idea of making people envious. Because sometimes when we think of envy or jealousy, we think, oh, that's a terrible thing. No one should be jealous. Well, Scripture says that God is. Oh. Well, what about the Ten Commandments? It says, don't be jealous. Well, wait, 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 just a moment. It says, do not covet anything that your neighbor owns. So what does Paul mean when he says he wants to make the Israelites envious? Because he surely doesn't want them to break a commandment. Because after all, they're Jews, and the Old Testament is their Bible, and the commandments, the, that's, that's the, the, the holy of holies. I mean, that is, that is it. So he surely doesn't want them to, to have a conflict about that. So what is it that Paul wants them to be envious of? Is what happens here make people envious. Uh, the, the difference is uh, it, it's not look at me, per se, it's look at him. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, are they envious, question number one, are they envious of our love? Are they envious of our love? I remember growing up well, I'm still in the process of it, actually. Uh, but I remember when I was growing up, um, I grew up uh, in a home, mom, dad, me, brother. And uh, that's, that's how it was. Dad was going a lot for work. Uh, it was just a necessity. Mom was home with us. That's, that's the way our family dynamics worked. And I... Uh, while mom and dad weren't, uh, weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, I knew, even at a young age, and then growing up, and now being married and having kids myself, I know that they love each other. And, and I knew then, I kind of want my family to be like that someday. Like, I vividly remember, uh, you know, mom and dad coming to... to practices and games and dropping us off and taking us to these things. I, I remember them supporting and, and helping and giving advice and giving comfort and, and all that stuff. I, I remember vividly Dad would be gone for a while. He'd come back from a long trip. He'd come in, he'd say hi to us and whatever. But I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, he would come home from a long trip and Mom would get a big hug in the kitchen. And not just a quick, hey, honey, how's it going, and move on, but like a solid hug. I remember that stuff. And, and here's the thing. I, 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 I was a kid once, and I remember that stuff. I don't remember much by way of words of advice or wisdom or lessons or, or, or things like that. But I remember dad hugging mom. See, a lot of times we as adults, we think that what we say is the most important thing that we'll ever do. But in fact, most of the time, it's what we do that's more important than what we say. See, especially with kids, more is caught than taught. And so I knew that when I had a wife and I came home, that I wanted to make sure that she knew that she was missed, that I loved her. 
I knew that when I had a son or daughter, I wanted them to know that they were missed and that I loved them. That there was something about the love that existed within my home, and I know not all homes were like that. Uh, there was something about the love that existed in my home that I wanted for myself. I was a part of it, but at a different level. And I just wonder if people ever look at the church or look at Christians and go, I see the love that exists there, and I want a part of that. Jesus, actually, in John chapter 13, is my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. John 13, verse 34 and 35 is my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Uh, Jesus is in the upper room. His story is coming to a close, so to speak. Jesus is in the upper room. He's just got done washing the disciples' feet. All of the disciples' feet. Guys' feet are really gross. I don't know if you've seen guys' feet, but guys' feet are really gross. And especially back then, no socks, not, no, no, no gel inserts. It, it, they're just walking sandals or barefoot, and it's just gross. And so Jesus is washing their feet. This humble act of of service from their rabbi, their teacher, their Lord and Savior, washing their feet. Jesus has sat down at a table with these men and women, by the way. There were women in the upper room. He sat down with these men and women, these disciples of Christ, and they're sharing this meal, which is an ultimate act of love. Sharing a meal with someone. And he says things like, uh, whoever drinks of this blood, whoever drinks of this cup, will experience forgiveness of their sins. Who, whoever eats of this bread will be brought into the new covenant. He, he shares a meal with everyone there. He washes the feet of everyone there. And that's not just the fun people, right? That's not just Peter. That's not just John or James or Judas. Judas. Judas, the one who sold him out. Peter, the, the one who denied he even knew him. James and John, who could barely keep their temper under control. Jesus had a way of showing this kind of radical love. And he, he gets to, to, to John chapter 13 after having this ultimate act of service, this ultimate act of, of fellowship, and he says, guys, guys, I'm going to give you a new commandment. And they're, they're, they're listening with Israelite ears. And the Old Testament is their Bible, and the commandments are the holy of holies. And so they hear that word commandment and go, oh, oh, oh. what do you got for us, Jesus? He says, everybody lean in. Here it is. Love each other. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. And then he drops the bombshell. He says, everybody will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. And so my question is, are people envious of our love? Do they, do they look at the church and go, man... Look at the compassion. Look at the forgiveness. Look at the love of those people. Is that the common conversation about Christians today? Hmm. See, love is the evidence that something radical has happened. Love, I'll say it again, is the evidence that something radical has happened. Even within Paul's life, Paul was a persecutor of Christians. And then you fast forward a couple chapters in Acts, and he's hanging out with them. Matthew was a tax collector, taking off the top for himself, collecting for the Romans. He was uh, uh, in the midst of all sorts of unsavory characters. And then you fast forward a couple chapters, and he's in the middle of the disciples. Zacchaeus was a wee little man who wanted to see Jesus more clearly, who ended up giving back to those he had wronged. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this household. 
Love is the evidence that something radical ha has happened. It, it, it's the evidence that something unique has changed the narrative. Is there any evidence of that in our churches? Question number two, are they envious of our unity? Are they envious of our unity? I don't know if you uh, are familiar with the name Kevin Durant or not. Kevin Durant is a former MVP of the National Basketball Association. Kevin Durant is a multiple time scoring champion. Kevin Durant is a talented basketball player. <clears throat> This summer, he was looking for a new team to play for. He had, his contract had ran up, and so he was looking for a new team to play with. Who's he going to sign with? He had multiple options. He could stay with the team that he was at and receive the most money. He, he could go back to his home of Washington, D.C. and play. He, he could go to the bright lights of New York or Los Angeles. He had options to go anywhere he wanted because a player like that, people will change things for. That was a big story this summer. Another big story in the National Basketball Association was this past year, a record was broken that people never thought would be broken. A team won 73 out of 82 regular season games. Out of an 82 game schedule, they lost nine times. That's incredible. The Golden State Warriors accomplished something that no one thought would even be accomplished, and yet they did it. And this summer, Kevin Durant, who had the option to go anywhere that he wanted to, who could have commanded all sorts of money, chose to sign with the Golden State Warriors. Why? It didn't have to do with money. It didn't even have to do with really winning a title because the Warriors got beat this year in the finals. No, when the Warriors sat down and had their meeting with Kevin Durant, it was about unity. The Warriors MVP said, look, I don't care who wins MVP this year as long as we win together. The, the conversation was not, uh, I'm going to get my shots and, and you can have whatever's left. It's Think of how well we will play together. And if you watch them play this last year, it, there was ball movement, and they're having fun, and their MVP didn't even have to play the fourth quarter of most games because they were already ahead, because the team was succeeding. Do people look at the church and go, they're succeeding together? Do, do they look at the church and go, wow, look at the way that they share. Look at the way they support one another. Look at the way that they encourage one another. I want to take you back. If you want to go there, you can. If not, just listen. I want to take you back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. The Holy Spirit had come down. <laughs> the, the gospel had gone out in multiple languages to everybody who was gathered for the festival. Thousands of people from all different backgrounds coming together under the banner of Christ and things are happening rapidly and things are changing and we don't know what's going on but there's something radical that has happened and you've got people from different age brackets and different tax brackets and different ethnicities and different belief backgrounds all coming together under one heading that says Jesus died once for all. And in Acts 42, start, or 4, verse 32, Luke writes, he says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Do people look at the church? Do they look at Christianity and go, wow, look at how united they are? No. Do, 
do they look at the church and go, look look at the way that they support each other. That person had a need and it was taken care of. That person had an abundance and they got rid of it to, to, to help, to provide, to support, to share. The, th that person needed a friend and they had four of them. That person needed a, a driver and they had a list of people willing to take them wherever they needed to go. This person was sick. They had visitors. This person was in prison. They had people who, who helped make them feel alive. People look at us and go, wow, look at their unity. Or do they say something else? See, unity is the evidence. Something radical has happened. There is no reason why it acts, all these people would come together. Just wouldn't happen. There's no reason. See, you wronged me back in the day, and you, well, you just look different, and, and you are beneath me financially, and there's no reason why we all should hang out. And yet, as you read through the book of Acts, as the church is getting going and moving, and thousands are coming, it's, there's something radical that has happened here. What is it? Well, there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And up from the grave he arose so that we could experience the forgiveness of sins and the promise of paradise. That is the radical thing that has happened. And when that radical thing happened and people started talking about it, it leveled the playing field and dropped the walls that separated people and brought us all together as brother and sister, son and daughter. Why is it that we keep raising those walls back up? We say, well, you, you go to that church. You dress like that. You, you did what to your face? I, I don't. Yeah. Wait, wait, you married who? No. You're, you're living that way? In that part of town with those people? You're that color? You voted for them? See, all too often, our eagerness is to build walls when, in fact, Jesus knocked them down. And that unity was supposed to be evidence that something radical has happened so that people draw near and go, gee, what is going on there? Those people are together, and they're united, and they're all different. And, and it doesn't make any sense. The only reason that they would possibly come together is if somebody rose from the dead. But all too often, that's not our focus. Next question. Are they envious of our salvation? Are they envious of our salvation? I, uh, had some digestive issues growing up. I won't go into detail, this is gross. But let's just say I had some digestive issues. And uh, so mom thought she would help out, so she, she decided that she was gonna buy me some fiber cereal. That'll help, fiber cereal. Now, I had breakfast every morning before school or whatever, so I sat down my first day with my bowl of fiber cereal, spent 20 years ago or whatever, and I take a big bite of milk-soaked fiber cereal. I'm pretty sure somebody just took a cardboard box, threw it in a tree chipper, and then collected it all and poured milk over it. That's what fiber cereal Tasted like. Now, I'm sure technology has improved. I'm sure fiber cereal is delicious now. But it was just. 
disgusting at that point. It had no flavor. It was bland. It was just bland. <laughs> Meanwhile, my brother, who had no digestive issues, is sitting with his bowl of fruit loops. <laughs> and we a new flavor. Look at all these colors. Do we have a fiber faith or a fruit loop faith? <laughs> Does our faith have no flavor? I mean, if you ask Christians what their spirituality, what their faith, what their beliefs are like, is it kind of like eating soggy cardboard? Does that look on their face like, do they lose all color, the smile drops, and it's bleh. Are they envious of our salvation? See, Paul had a fruit loop faith, and I want to take you to Ephesians quickly. Ephesians chapter 2. He's talking to this church in Ephesus, and he's reminding them of this faith that they aspire to. Ephesians chapter 2, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is not a faith of blah. That is a faith of vitality. That is a faith of life. That is a faith of movement and excitement. But unfortunately, when you ask people nowadays, what do you think about Christians? Or tell me about the Christian faith. It's bad. So what happened? Where, when did we lose our joy? When did we lose our enthusiasm? When did we lose that excitement that we're not going to hell tomorrow? proclamation of salvation is evidence that something radical has happened. Now, you caught a common theme through this whole thing. Our proclamation of salvation is evidence that something radical has happened. Here's the thing, people. If, if, if people outside of the faith, if people outside of the church don't see this radical love, this radical unity, this radical proclamation of a rabbi who died for all of humanity, offered forgiveness of sins so that we could experience paradise with our creator, then we will not be witnesses. Because a blah love and a blah unity and a blah salvation doesn't make anybody in peace. So just what happens here? Make people envious. Does what happens here, individually, in our homes, in our churches, does what happens here make people envious? Not of what we've got, because it's not about look at me. It's about look at him. It's not about coveting what we've got or what we don't got. It's about recognizing what we've been blessed with, what we've been given. That is the gift 
of grace, not given because we earned it, not given because we have the right namesake or the right denomination. It's given freely by God. This is what happens here. Make people envious. All too often, their reaction is not envy. It's pity. Poor Christians. I can't get along. Anger. Rejection. Resentment. All too often, their reaction is not envy, but it's something much, much worse. Maybe even apathy. They just, they don't care. Perhaps what we need to do then is to fall more in love with Jesus than ourselves. Maybe we need to make much of him and less of us. At the end of Romans 11, there's a doxology that we're going to read together the next couple of weeks. And so I'd ask you to read this doxology together with me, to make much of him. To remind us that something radical has happened. Would you join me in this doxology? Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Father, today... We recognize that all too often our lives are about ourselves. We think that we are the main character in our story, when in fact we are the supporting cast. That we are, we are given breath, and we are given life, and we are given opportunity, not by what we do, but by your grace. Father, we didn't ask you to come and save us, but you did. God, in the moments that we rejected you, you held us closer. You gave us the gospel, Lord, and so I pray that we would be one like Jesus prayed in the garden. I pray that our love would be so radical that no one is excluded, but that all are brought near as Jesus commanded in the upper room. And God, I pray that we would not be able to keep quiet about the miraculous, radical thing that happened on Calvary. That God himself took on flesh. He bore the sins of the world. He bled and died so that all might have forgiveness. later, he conquered death itself to prove that you, in fact, are in control. God, I pray that we would never be quiet about that. That when people discuss faith, when they think about the church, when they think about Christians, they, they don't think about this kind of raw, monotone, that is alive. Something that is moving. Something that is doing. Something that is changing. Something that is beyond description and beyond compare. Not because of who is involved, but because of you. May our lives be a reflection of this radical grace. Of this incredible creation. The Savior who always forgives. 
And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.